Okay, your test grades are posted on Canvas. Um, overall, the grades were were pretty good. The average, I think, was a s in the high 70s, like a 76, 77, 78, something like that, which for a time value of money and a risk and return test, that's a pretty good average. Um, the grades range from a 100 to less than 100. So pretty wide range of, of grades. But overall, it was, it was, a, good, it was a good outcome. If, if you didn't score as well as you would have liked on that, I mean, the good thing is you're not going to see that material again, so we're moving on to, to other things. But we are going to be using some of what we learned in time value of money in Chapter 6, which we're going to start today. Um, a little bit in Chapter 7, not too much really. But then when we get to the uh, capital budgeting section, we uh, will be using some of it again, mostly present value calculations. So the time with your financial calculator is not over yet, but it's, it is uh, quickly winding down. Now, let me explain how the rest of the semester is going to go. Um, we've got, I forget how many weeks after, after this. I will go ahead and tell you now that this week we're going to cover, hopefully today and Thursday, we're going to make it through Chapter 6, which is bonds and bond valuation. We're kind of shifting gears now. We're moving into um, investments. So different types of investments. So in Chapter 6, we'll talk about bonds. In Chapter 7, we'll talk about stocks, the stock, stock market, how to get started. And also, we're looking at this in terms of how do companies raise money. So they can raise money by issuing bonds, by issuing stocks. And then we're going to jump ahead to Chapters 9, um, well, parts of 9, parts of 10. It's actually parts of 6, 7, 9, 10, etc. So when you look at what's going to be on the final exam, you may say, wow, that's a lot of chapters. Well, it is, but it's just parts of chapters. So the actual material itself is probably not as much as was on test two that you just took. So what we're going to do from here on out is we're just going to cover the material. We're going to go until we're finished, and then we'll take your final exam. And also, you've got something uh, that I think most of you will find useful. On the same day as your final exam, you have what's called a bonus test. The bonus test covers an additional chapter that we will cover in class. It consists of 15 questions. It's one five, 15 questions, and they count one point each. Any of those questions that you get correct are a point added to your final exam grade. So you can make up to 15 additional points on your final exam. So that is really, really helpful when it comes to, now it's not your average. Some students say, Wow, if I make an eight, that means you're going to add eight points to my average? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to add eight points to your final exam grade. But it's still really helpful because you can score up to 15 points. So on the final exam, you'll have two tests, actually. You'll take your regular final. It'll be 50 questions, just like you've been having. You'll take it, turn it in. I'll hand you the second test, the bonus test, 15 questions. You can't hurt yourself. You can guess at every question if you want to. And so what I'm doing with it, with that test is essentially I'm putting the ball in your court and saying if you want to study additional material for this and score a 13 or a 14 or a 15 that's up to you if you don't want to look at it and you think statistically out of 15 questions if there are four answers you should make four out of 15 that's fine too that's okay it doesn't matter to me okay so it's completely up to you um, also next week I don't know what to call it next week. Next week, we are going to call it a Finance 330 Personal Study Week. Okay? I'm going to be out of town all week. Uh, boy. <laughs> that hurts my feelings, man. That hurts my feelings. <laughs> I'm going to be at a conference. Actually, academics. So I'm going to be at a conference. The fact that it's in Florida is not important, okay? But I'm going to be at a conference all week in Florida. And so what we'll do is we'll have, uh, you'll have one small thing to do. It's going to be a quiz related to Chapter 6, five questions, uh, an online quiz. But other than that, um, it is a personal study week for you to do with what you want. And then we'll pick back up the week after next and finish out the material. No video. I mean, I can assign some if you want to. Okay.
no, no videos. Okay, so, oh, one other thing. I sent out, for any of you who are graduating, I sent out an email yesterday through Canvas regarding a, um, a full-time job at CFSB Bank, and it's in their uh, finance department. And so if any of you are interested, take a look at that. You know, they're looking for, uh, primarily if you're a May graduate or if you know somebody who has graduated who is looking for a job because of the full-time position. But I also received this email, and there's a company, it's actually, not many people know about it, but it's called Wisdom Tree Technology. It's actually located at the corner of North 16th and 121 in the, um, I'm not sure what they call it, Heritage Hall, maybe, that big Murray State building right on the corner there uh, with the columns in front of it. And Wisdom Tree is looking for four part-time employees. They're and I'm not really sure, the, it's probably related to something to do with a government contract, why it's so specific. But it's four part-time employees for 10 hours per week. Now there could be some manipulation there in the hours, I don't know. But this is the email, I'm gonna actually send this out to everybody, uh, hopefully later today. But uh, as you can see, two of them are basically general office type duties and two are human resource related duties. Um, now the thing is, you have to live within a certain area. And so this is the area within Callaway County, this is the area within Graves County. So depending on where you fit in this, you might want to take a look at these to see where you, uh, actually where you are lo located. That's where they're hiring from. So don't, don't ask me why they have to be within this certain hub. Uh, it's called a hub zone or a census tract. But I'm guessing there's probably some free money available for the company since they have a lot of government contracts if they hire people within a certain geographic area. So again, I'll send this out. If you're interested, I would encourage you to apply. Uh, the gentleman who is president of this company is Scott Allen. Scott teaches our Finance 350 class. He, that's uh, a really interesting class. That's our counter threat terrorism, our counter threat finance class. And so it sort of teaches you how to follow money from a bank to, uh, overseas or even from overseas back to a bank in maybe Western Kentucky. Um, and he actually, in this part of this company, they do a lot of different things, but one thing to do is they train government employees and military, um, basically special forces, to trace money, to follow money. And so if you're interested, that class is being taught in the fall semester, it's Finance 350. And also let me remind you, for those of you who are registering, that, let's see, am I teaching a class next semester that you could, in the fall I don't think I am, I'm teaching 537, so you can't take that yet. Uh, in the summer I'm teaching Finance 330 and 332, second summer session. It's going to be taught as an online class, so you don't actually have to be at a physical location to take the class, although you don't have to pay for online, the cost of an online class, okay? We call it that, we call it a hybrid class. So the tests are online, the quizzes are online, my lectures are videotaped at the ITV classroom, and so you can just watch the lectures and take the tests. Uh, so the class only meets 10 times over five weeks, two times per week at night. Um, so if any of you are interested in that, um, be happy to talk to you about it. I've had several of you in my office this, uh, I guess the last couple of weeks, talking about changing your major to finance or to maybe finance with the commercial banking option, which is our newest degree, or finance with the uh, certified financial planning option. So while registration is here, if you're interested in that, let me encourage you to come see me this week before I leave town so that we can kind of map out what you need to take so that you don't take the wrong classes and get behind on some of your classes. All right, so anything else? Is that all the housekeeping that we have to do? Switching? Switching? Not yet? You will, you will. You can take it, it's an, it's, um, an additional class because in the, in the financial planning track, you've got five classes that you have to take. 
Um, one of them is investments. Every finance major has to take that, but the other four are optional. And so instead of giving you four finance electives, they're filled up with those mandatory classes. So if you wanted to take the commercial bank management class, the 537, you could. It's just, it will be an additional class. It wouldn't count. I mean, you'd get credit for it, but it wouldn't help you with your graduation. The commercial banking is like the, yeah, it's got their specific classes for it that you have to take also. So Finance 350 is one. Um, we've got a lending class, a compliance class, and the commercial bank management class. All right, so other questions before we jump into chapter six, which is interest rates. The first part of the chapter is on interest rates. I don't, this is what I talked about. We're gonna be jumping around and covering just parts of chapters. And by that, I mean, for some chapters, we may cover three or four pages, that's it. Um, but I will let you know, you know, what we're covering in each chapter so you're not worried with, you know, you don't have to worry about reading the entire chapter if I don't think you, it's important for you to know. So this is interest rates and bond valuation. You cover interest rates in other classes, so that's why we're pretty much skipping them in here. But as uh, most of you know, interest rate is simply the cost of borrowing money. So if, as an individual, if you borrow money, then you have to pay interest to the, to the lender, to the bank, or to whoever loans you money. If you're a corporation and you obtain a loan from a bank, you have to pay interest. Another way that corporations can borrow money is they can issue bonds. And we'll talk about this in just a minute, kind of what a bond is. So let me skip through some of these. Now, some of these terms here, like default risk, maturity risk, et cetera, it won't hurt you to know these, but again, we're not gonna spend much time on this. I wanna to get to the actual concept of bonds. Okay, now this is the official definition of a bond, two-part definition. A bond is a long-term debt instrument used by businesses and governments to raise money. So if the state of Kentucky needs to raise money to build a bridge. Or to, if Murray State University needs to raise money to build a new physics building, they can issue bonds. Now, most bonds pay interest, well, most bonds have a face value of $1,000, they pay interest semi-annually, and they have a maturity of 10 to 30 years. So these are long-term debt instruments. When I refer to the term debt, what I'm talking about is borrowed money. So when you hear the term, you know, somebody's deep in debt, that means they have borrowed a lot of money. Now, to simplify bonds and, and kind of how this works, let's say that I may, as I said, corporations or governments can issue bonds to raise money. Now, the way they work is, let's say that I'm a corporation, Lacewell Incorporated, and I need to raise $50 million to build a new factory. Well, I've got several options as a corporation. I can, as I said earlier, and I can simply take out a loan in my corporation's name for $50 million. I can issue stock, either common stock or preferred stock, to raise the money. And we'll talk about that in Chapter 7. Or I can issue bonds, Lacewell Corporation bonds. Now, these bonds are going to have what's called a coupon rate associated with them. The coupon rate is the interest rate that the bond pays. And the way it's gonna work is, I'm gonna sell these bonds, $50 million worth, typically in $1,000 increments. So if one of you wants to buy one of my bonds, the way it works is, you give me your cash temporarily, I give you the bond, and since I'm using your money, I'm going to pay you interest as the bond holder typically every six months. So I'm going to send you a check. Okay, well actually it's just going to be put into your account. But I'm going to, uh, the way it used to be done, I'm going to send you a check for interest every six months. And it's going to happen, say it's a 20 year bond. So every year for six months, I'm going to send you a check for interest. At the end of the 20 year period, when the bond matures, I'm going to send you the last interest check Plus, I'm going to send you back the original amount that I borrowed from you, which was $1,000. So a bond is just a loan. That's all it is. 
So if the government issues bonds and you buy a government bond, what you're doing, you're loaning the government money for a temporary period of time. If a corporation issues bonds, you're loaning them money for a temporary period of time. So don't overcomplicate it. A lot of times people look at bonds and they, they get a little confused when we talk about semi-annual interest and a 10 to a 30 year maturity and coupon rates and all of this. It's a pretty simple process. Okay, so don't, don't overcomplicate it. So long-term debt instrument used by businesses and governments to raise money. Now, there are different types of bonds. For example, I mentioned earlier, you can have uh, what's called treasury bonds. These are issued by the United States government. The United States government is very, very good at spending more than they have coming in in terms of tax revenue. And when you spend more than you have coming in, guess what? You have to borrow to make up the difference. And the way the government borrows is they issue United States Treasury bonds. And there are lots of purchasers. Individuals buy U.S. Treasury bonds. Banks are big purchasers of Treasury bonds because they're very safe. Also, foreign governments are huge purchasers of United States Treasury bonds, again, because they're very, very safe. You've also got corporate bonds. I mentioned, that, I mentioned that earlier. These are issued by corporations. So, I mean, it could be any corporation. And we'll talk about rating, bond ratings a little bit later. You also have something called municipal bonds. These are also called munis. And municipal bonds are issued by state governments or local governments. So, as again, the state of Kentucky, the, you know, Murray State University, Callaway County, the city of Murray, and the great thing about municipal bonds is municipal bonds are tax free, which means when you receive the interest on a municipal bond, you don't pay federal income tax on it, and typically you don't pay state or local income tax. So municipal bonds are really, really popular investments with higher income earners because you're in a high tax bracket, you can save those taxes. And then finally, you've got foreign bonds and this is just kind of a catch-all category. These are bonds issued by foreign governments or foreign corporations. Some foreign bonds are fantastic investments, very safe. Other foreign bonds are riskier, but they, the risk might pay off. For example, if you want to buy a bond issued by the country of Greece. By the way, what's been happening in Greece over the last 10 to 15 years? Okay, they're not in very good position financially, okay? They're trying to make a turnaround, it's a really slow process, and they're just not in good shape financially. What that means is if you want to buy a country of Greece bond right now, a Greek issued bond, you're probably going to earn somewhere between, I think the yield right now is somewhere around 35 to 40 percent on a Greek bond. If you buy a United States Treasury bond right now, you're going to earn about 1.5%. So 35% is 1.5%. Now, knowing what you know about risk and return, what does that imply about the risk of Greek bonds compared to the risk of United States government bonds? A lot higher risk in Greece, that's right. But what happens if Greece actually turns around and they can make all those interest payments, the country improves, you've got a really, really sweet return on your money. But again, it's a big risk. And that's that risk reward trade-off that we've been talking about. If you want to take some risk, I mean, you might get a high reward for that. But again, if you want a low risk investment, you would invest in government, United States government bonds and not Greek government bonds. All right, so different types of bonds. Now, these are some of the key features, some of the key terms that we'll be talking about. For example, the par value of a bond, that's what's called its face value. That's what it's worth when it matures. And typically, that's $1,000, although it doesn't have to be. You can have bonds that have a $5,000 face value, $10,000, $100,000, even a $1 million face value bonds. But the problem with that is most people can't afford to purchase a $1 million bond. Most people can't afford to invest in a $1,000 bond, and so that's why they're typically $1,000. Now, 
There's a coupon rate. That's the interest rate that the bond pays. To determine the interest that it pays, you're simply going to multiply the coupon rate by the par value. So for example, if it's an 8% coupon bond, if you multiply 8% times $1,000, it pays $80 every year in interest. And actually, it gets its name, the coupon interest rate, because before everything was electronic, bonds actually, when you bought a bond, you received an actual piece of paper called a bond certificate and it actually had coupons on the bond certificate. And so what would happen is every time that you were doing interest payment, you would cut the coupon off, you would mail it to the issuer, so whatever the corporation or the government agency was, and they would mail you back a check for the interest. So that's where the name coupon payment comes from. It was an actual coupon. Now, there are certain category bonds called zero coupon bonds, or another name for them are deep discount bonds. And these are bonds, as the name implies, they sell at a deep discount from their par value. They don't pay interest during the life of the bond. So for example, if you buy a zero coupon bond and you pay $600 for it today, and you hold it until it matures and it's worth $1,000, the difference between what you pay for it, the $600, and its maturity value, the $1,000, that $400, that is your interest that you receive, and you receive it all at once. You don't receive it every six months or every year like a coupon paying bond would provide. So zero coupon bonds or deep discount bonds. The maturity of a bond, that's the years until it matures. Now, we said most bonds mature in 10 to 30 years. But if you want to, you can buy a bond that matures next year. If it matures in one year, we don't necessarily know I mean, we could find out, but we don't necessarily know if it was a 10-year bond issued nine years ago or a 20-year bond matured nine, excuse me, issued 19 years ago or a 30-year bond issued 29 years ago. It doesn't really matter to us. What we're interested in is what's happening going forward in the next year. So if you want to buy a bond that matures in one year, two years, five years, 10 years, 20, whatever, I mean, you can find all different types of bonds, risk, and maturity levels because the bond market is just as big and active as the stock market. We'll talk about the stock market in chapter seven. The stock market tends to get more attention. You hear more about it on the news, it's more exciting. College students tend to be more interested in stocks in the stock market. It's just a sexier place to do business. The bond market, for the most part, I mean, to be perfectly honest, it's, it's just pretty boring. I describe bonds as the vanilla ice cream of the investment world. Because if you think about it, if you're looking, for example, if you're going to go to go into an ice cream shop and you've got 50 flavors of ice cream in front of you, vanilla is probably not going to be at the top of your list. You've got a lot more exciting choices. But if you've just got the choice between vanilla ice cream or nothing, it's okay. I mean, it's not bad. So bonds are sort of simple for the most part, not extremely exciting. They're, they tend to be fairly conservative investments unless we get into something like Greek country bonds, that type of thing, uh, or junk bonds. We'll talk about junk bonds a little bit later in the chapter. But for the most part, they're safe, conservative not really exciting investments, but they're a really important investment because it's one way that corporations raise a lot of money, and it's also a huge investment field for individuals and other corporations. I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of bonds are bought and sold every single day. So it's, it's a huge market. The issue date, of course, when the bond is issued, and then default risk, this is the risk that the bond issuer is not gonna make the interest payments or the principal payment, which is the face value, when they come due. And that's, there's some serious consequences associated with that, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, a couple of different things, uh, we call these provisions that can be within a bond issue. Now, keep in mind, if, if a company or a government wants to issue a bond, they can write this bond issue up any way they want. I mean, they can put all kinds of stipulations in there and uh, different provisions. 
The problem is, if they make it too strict or too strange or just too weird, people aren't going to buy their bonds. It's just that simple. But there are a couple of provisions that you need to be aware of. One's called a call provision. And a call provision simply means that at a certain time in the future, and it's stated in the bond contract, you know, two, three, four, five, six years, whenever, that the bond issuer can buy back the bonds if interest rates go down between the time the bond was issued and the call date. So it's pretty simple. That means that if you are, for example, let's say that I originally issued my Laceville Corporation bonds at an 8% coupon. So that means for each $1,000 bond, I'm paying $80 per year in interest. Now, let's say that over the last five years, interest rates have gone on this particular risk bond, interest rates have gone from 8%, which is what I had to pay initially to sell my bonds, they've gone from 8% to 4%. Now, as a good business person, if I'm thinking, okay, I can pay 8% interest on my bonds, or I could refinance this bond issue and pay just 4%, I'm going to save a lot of money on these bonds. So what I can do if I've got a call provision in my bond contract is I can simply contact you, the bond purchasers, and I can say, hey, guess what? I want to buy my bond back. Now, as the bond purchaser, you're not happy about this because you currently own a bond that pays 8% interest and the market rate of interest right now is 4%. So if I buy your bond back from you, you have to reinvest the money you have to reinvest it at a 4% interest rate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you something called a call premium. And that's going to be, I mean, it's going to be a tiny amount. I may pay you an extra $50 uh, to $100. So I'll give you back your $1,000 plus $50 or plus $100 for your trouble. But I'm going to buy my bonds back. Now, this is the same thing as when, a per, when rates go down, what people do is they refinance their home mortgage. So if they've got a mortgage loan at 8% and rates go down to 4 they're going to go to the bank and they're going to say, hey, I want to pay my old loan off, I want a new loan, but instead of paying 8% interest, I want to pay 4%. This is the same thing that we're talking about here. And typically, um, these um, calls are to protect the issuer of the bond. So the bond issuer is the one who's helped by this. The bond purchaser is the one who can be hurt by this because you may lose your really good investment because somebody's going to force you to sell it back to them. There's also something called a redeemable at par clause. And this says the holder can sell the bond back to the issuer for a par value. It protects the holder from rising interest rates. So in this example, we said this protects the bond issuer. The redeem what par protects the bond purchaser. So what that means is, and we'll, we'll learn this in a minute, when, and one of the most basic things that you will learn in any finance class is that there is a negative relationship between bond prices and interest rates. And again, we'll talk about this later. What that means is if market interest rates go up, the price of bonds go down. If interest rates go down, the price of bonds go up. So in this case, if I'm holding a bond, let's say, okay, let's go back to the example. You, you purchased one of my bonds, an 8% bond. Let's say that interest rates go up to 12%. What that means is the value of your bond since interest rates have gone up, the value, the cash value of your bond has gone down. It's gone way down. And if it has a redeemable par clause, what this means is you can simply contact me as the bond owner and you can say, hey, guess what? I want you to buy my bond back and I want you to buy it back at its full face value of $1,000. And I have to do that because it has the redeemable at par clause. Now, again, not all bonds have these in them. So again, it's really important to know what kind of bonds you're buying. Read the fine print, uh, but you buy bonds just like you buy stocks.
If you've got an online trading account like a Scott trade account, you can simply get online and within 10 seconds you can have invested in a bond of some type. All right, now some of these other items, I'm just going to let you take a look at these on your own, some of these uh, terms. Things like a bond indenture, a standard debt provision, restrictive covenants. Um, subordination, a sinking fund requirement, uh, a trustee, these types of things. So I'll let you take a look at those on your own. Okay, now, the main part of this chapter is bond valuation. How do we calculate the price of a bond? And so that's what you see here. Now what you've got here, this is a 10-year, 10% annual coupon bond. And the RD, this is a required return of debt. So this is the current market rate of interest. And it's 10%. So what this says is, this bond's going to mature in 10 years. It pays 10% interest per year, and it pays the interest once per year an annual coupon. So what you have in front of you, again, this is a timeline going from time period zero, which is today, to time period 10. So the $100, this is the 10% of the $1,000. Now, it doesn't mention the face value of the bond, but if it doesn't mention it, we assume it's $1,000. So 10% of 1,000 is an interest payment of $100 per year. So the first year, you're gonna receive $100 in interest. The second year, 100. The third year, 100. Fourth, fifth, sixth, and eighth night. And in the 10th year, you're gonna receive your last interest payment plus the $1,000 par value back from the bond. Now, these are the future cash flows created by the bond. 100, 100, 100, 100 for 10 years, and then 1,000. And to find the current selling price of the bond, we're gonna find the present value which is a chapter five term, the present value of the future cash flows created by the bond. So all we're doing is where you'll notice on the second line here, this is our present value formula, the cash flow divided by one plus the interest rate. So this is just a series of present value calculations. So this is present value calculations, this, this, so you would have a total of 11 present value calculations. And then this is the present value of $100, taken back one year at 10%, $90.91. And we do the same thing for all of these, add them together, and this bond should be selling for $1,000 exactly. So if you buy this bond, under these conditions, you're gonna pay exactly $1,000 for it. It's unusual to pay exactly $1,000 for a bond. Typically it's gonna be more or less than 1,000 because interest rates are constantly going up or going down. And when that happens, the negative happens to the price of the bond. So if we want to calculate the, now we can do this if you want to. We can calculate the value of a bond by simply using these formulas. And with a, a bond that matures in two or three or four years, it's not really a big deal. But if we've got a 30-year bond, and you've got 30 present value calculations, it takes a while. If you've got a 30-year bond that pays interest semi-annually, that's 30 times two, that's 60 present value calculations. It takes a while. But if we've got a financial calculator, we're simply going to enter, in this case, four variables and solve for the fifth, and it takes about five seconds to calculate the price of a bond. So these are our inputs. Future value, that's gonna be the, the face value of the bond. N is the number of years to maturity or the number of interest payments. The payment is gonna be the coupon rate times the par value, which is gonna be a dollar amount. And the I slash Y is gonna be the required return or the rate that similar risk newly issued bonds are paying. It's also known as a yield to maturity. So in this case, now if we let me bring up my financial calculator. If you remember, it, back in chapter five, we were using our time value funding row of keys, but we only entered three variables and we solved for the fourth. So at bonds, we're simply entering one additional variable. And normally, if we're solving for the price, we're gonna solve for the present value. Okay, now this is your bond valuation formula. 
I mean, you won't be using this, but I did want to bring it to your attention just in case you wanted to take a look at it. And let's take a look at this example to calculate the price of this bond. Uh, it says Mills Company, a large defense contractor, issued 10% coupon interest rate bonds. They have 10 years uh, to maturity and a thousand dollar par value. They pay interest annually. If investors buy this bond, they receive the contractual rights to two cash flows. One is a hundred dollar interest payment per year. The other is a one thousand dollars when the bond matures. And assuming that interest is paid when it's supposed to be, these are for inputs for a financial calculator. And so what's happening with this bond is it's creating a hundred dollars in interest and so this is what we're doing we're simply taking all of these cash flows back to time period zero and then finally this is the one thousand dollar that is worth when it's mature and we're taking it back to time period zero this is the present value of the interest payment 61446 this is the present value of the, of the face value of the par value if we add these two together this is the selling price of the bond at time period zero or today a thousand dollars and with your financial calculator, these would be your inputs. So if you've got your financial calculator with you, if you would, take it out. And the first thing you need to check is make sure that it's set to one payment per year because with bonds, we're gonna have it, we're gonna leave it set to one payment per year. So if we're at this point, if we press our second key and our I slash Y to check our payments. Mine is set to 12. Okay, I need it set to one. So if I press the one key and the enter key, now I press my clear key. Now, with bonds, it's ex it was important with regular time value money. With bonds, it's critically important that you clear your calculator out after each problem because if you don't you're going to get some really really odd answers so once I'm here back at zeros so I'm going to press my second key clear time value of money second and clear work and now I'm just going to put these in doesn't matter what order I put them in so I'll just I'll just follow this order so 10 press my N key 10 is mine now this is the I slash Y key interest per year. 100 is the payment. And 1,000 is the future value of the bond, the par value. So now I've got my four inputs. I want to press my compute key in the top left hand corner and the present value. And so what this shows me is this bond, if I want to buy this bond today, I'm going to have to pay $1,000 exactly in the open bond market. So everybody come up with 1000 If you don't, let me know. You are, you're getting, well, you're actually earning 10% on your money that's what you're making because again the interest payments are going to be paid in the future so in this case uh, those interest payments are going to be flowing into you year one through year ten and you're right the present value of the interest payments is going to be less but it's still more than if you didn't invest the money at all okay so bonds should sell for a thousand dollars now based on this and this is talking about bond value behavior, what I talked about earlier. This is really the important thing here, and I'm going to explain this to you in a minute why this is, um, let me go back, why this is happening. There's a negative relationship between bond prices and interest rates, so when interest rates go up, bond prices go down and vice versa. Now, just telling you that's one thing, and that's, that's great, you need to know it for the test, it'll be a question on, on the final exam. But I want to show you why that's happening and why that has to happen. Now, with a bond, for example, on the left-hand side, you'll notice that 
we're going to leave everything the same with our, the bond that we just worked with. The only thing that has changed is the market rate of interest has gone from 10% to now it is the I slash Y is 12%. So market rates have gone from 10 to 12. They've gone up. So if we enter this information into our financial calculator, what you will find is, and you can put this in, I mean, we don't have to change everything. We can just go back to our calculator, which is here, and I can put in 12 I slash Y compute present value. And you'll notice the current price of the bond goes from 1,000 down to 887. Can anybody explain to me why in the world would I want to buy this bond for 887? Or why did the price go down to 887 from 1,000? What's happening here? Or we can look at another example. We can look at the one on the right-hand side of the screen where if we go back to our starting point of here and the market interest rate goes from 10%, now it goes down to 8%. So if we put in 8, I slash Y, compute, present value, look what happens to the price. The price goes up to 1,134. Now again, my question is, why would I want to pay 1,134 for this bond when I know it's going to be worth only $1,000 when it matures in 10 years? To me, that doesn't seem to make much sense to pay 1134 for an investment that I know is going to go down in value over the next 10 years. So why would I buy this bond? In this situation, under this example, the current market interest rate is what? We've gone over here to this side now. 8%. My bond is paying what interest rate? What coupon rate? 10. The original example is paying 10%. So my bond is paying 10. The current market rate of interest is 8. So if I want to buy a brand new bond just like mine, same risk and everything, I'm only going to earn 8% interest. So because my bond pays a higher interest rate than the current rate of interest, investors are willing to pay a premium to purchase my bond as compared to a brand new bond being issued right now. Because what's going to happen is we know that this bond, my bond, if they pay 11.34 for it, over the next 10 years, it's going to drop to be worth $1,000 when it matures. But during that 10 years, I've earned 10% interest instead of 8% interest. And so what that's going to cause to happen is my return on this bond, since I'm paying a premium for it, but I'm earning more interest, my return is going to be exactly the market rate of interest. In this case, it's 8%. It's not going to be higher than 8. It's not going to be lower than 8. It's going to be exactly 8%. And in the previous example here, where the market rate of interest has gone up to 12 and the bond was selling at a discount, you may look at this and you may think, wow, that's a really good deal because I can buy this bond for 887 and I can sell it, or well, I'm going to get $1,000 for it in 10 years when it matures. And that's true. You're going to have a capital gain of $113. But what about the interest payments that you receive? On the left-hand side, what are the current market rate of interest? What's it paying? 12%. So if I buy a brand new bond, it's paying 12% or $120 per year. What's my bond paying? 10%. Okay, only 100. So my bond is paying less interest. Now, for a rational investor, I cannot convince you to purchase my bond for $1,000 if you can buy the same bond and it pays 12% when mine's paying 10%. Nobody's going to buy it. So the price has to be forced down to the level that investors are willing to say, sure, at 887 I'll buy this bond. But for 890 or 900 or 910 or 920 or 930, I'm not willing to buy the bond. But at 887, my return on this bond, if I hold it until it matures, is going to be the capital gain of 113 plus my interest payment. So I'm going to have a market rate of return, a 12% return on this bond, no more and no less. So that's why we have the negative relationship. If you look at a bond, when rates go up, 
Nothing can change on a bond except the price. The par value can't change, the maturity can't change, you can't affect, you can't change the market rate of interest, you can't affect the interest payment. The only thing that can change is the market price of the bond, up or down. All right, here's a dangerous question. Does that make any sense to you? At least you're honest, okay? All right, so tell me, what do I have to do to make it make sense? I'm a little confused as to why the, the payment doesn't change. Are we supposed to multiply the principal by the, the interest rate? By the coupon interest rate. Oh. And so that is going to be this, the payment, yes. Yes, so my original bond, the coupon never changed. It stayed at 10%. But what I was showing here is what happens if interest rates go up to 12 or what happens if interest rates go down to 8 from the original 10%. And so this shows that if market rates go up, the price of the bond goes down. If market rates go down, the price of the bond goes up. That's the negative relationship that I talked about. The, the interest payment stays the same at 10% interest, but the, the real value of the bond goes up or down depending on what's happening with interest rates. This is if you're reselling the bond. Because you're receiving those interest payments on the bond. But again, most bonds aren't bought brand new. Most bonds are bought in the secondary market, just like most shares of stock are bought in the secondary market. So if somebody logs onto their, their trading account, they, they want to buy a state of Kentucky revenue bond that matures in 2025, and so they find it and they pay whatever price it's selling for. Initially, it is. Now, each year, the end is going to go down by one as the bond matures, it gets closer to maturity, each year it's going to go down. But this is assuming that we hold buy the bond and hold it until it matures. Not everybody does that. Some people buy, will buy the bond, buy the bond today, they hold it for six months, and they sell it. I mean, there's, there's lots of different reasons why they would, why they would do that. All right, so let's kind of just think about this for a minute as we, as we go through a couple more, couple more things. Now this shows you what's happening with our, in our example, so this kind of summarizes what we just talked about. This is our original starting point, the middle line here. Now, if a bond is selling for exactly its face value, we say it's selling at par. If the bond is selling for less than its face value, we say the bond is selling at a discount. And if it's selling them more than its face value, we say the bond is selling at a premium. But if our bond markets are efficient, and this kind of, this is sort of the reason we're talking about this, whenever we see a bond price, whether it's 887 or 1134 or 1000, we should be confident that that is the exact correct price for that particular bond. And we'll talk about this also in chapter 7 when we we'll talk about stocks because if we can't trust the prices set by the bond markets or the stock markets, What's going to happen? We're simply not going to invest in the bond markets or the stock markets. And if that happens, you're basically looking at the collapse of the economy right after. If everybody simply said, we don't trust the stock market or the bond markets, we're pulling our money out of that, the economy will collapse almost immediately. We have to be pretty confident about it. We have to be sure that we want to invest our money and we when we buy stock of Google or stock of Facebook or stock of Apple or stock of Walmart or if we buy a bond issued by Walmart we want to know we're paying the right price now that doesn't mean it's the price at which you're going to make money it simply means it's the price at which it should be selling right now there's a difference between that one again we'll talk about that more in, in the stock valuation chapter and then this is, this walks you through it too. This is an Excel 
Uh, we don't talk a lot about Excel in here, but Excel is a really, really fantastic program for time value of money calculations. They've got time value of money functions already in there, and so you can do future value, present value. I mean, a lot of powerful things with Excel. And then this is showing that negative relationship between bond prices and interest rates. So notice as interest rates increase, the price of the bond goes down. If interest rates go down, the price of the bond goes up. All right, let's see. Let me skip through a couple more of these. Okay, let's do, let's do a practice question just to see if, um, make sure everybody's getting the right answer. So let's value a bond. Let's say we've got a bond that the, the future value is 1,000. The bond is going to mature in 18 years. The current coupon rate of the bond is 6%, so that's going to be 6% times 1,000, which is a payment of $60 per year. And the current market rate of interest is 9%. So we're looking for the present value or the price of the bond. Now, without even calculating anything, do I know, based on this information, that this bond is selling for a premium or a discount? It's going to be selling for a discount. Why do we know we're selling at a discount? Interest rate. My bond's paying what interest rate? 6%. What's the current market rate of interest? 9%. So since I issued my bond, interest rates have gone up to 9%. So the price of my bond has to be forced down less than $1,000. Now, I don't know how much below a thousand, I just know it's less than a thousand. So if I enter this information, so I'm going to go through and then clear everything out, second, clear time value of money, second, clear work. One thousand is my future value. What I say for N? Eighteen is N. My bond is paying sixty. And the current market rate of interest was nine percent. I've got my four inputs. I want to now compute the present value. And that tells me if I want to buy this bond today, I'm going to pay seven hundred and thirty seven dollars and thirty three cents for this bond. Which well, sounds like a great deal. Because I'm buying the bond that's worth $1,000 for $737. But remember, I'm going to have a capital gain. Because the total yield for a bond is made up of two things. The total yield, so what you're going to earn on this bond... is equal to two things. One is what's called a capital gain or capital loss yield. And you also have an interest yield. Those two together. So if I buy this particular bond that we just looked at for $737, I'm going to have a capital gain. But my bond is only paying 6%, whereas the market rate of interest is 9%. So I'm earning less interest, but I'm making up for that less interest with the capital gain. But offsets. If the bond were selling, for example, if we go back to the example and we say, what if the bond uh, what if the market interest rate, instead of being, let's see if this is missing, okay, yeah, it's gone. Let's say the market rate is um, 4%. My bond's paying 6%. My bond's going to sell at a premium, 1253 So I've got a capital 
loss because it's going to go from two, what, twelve fifty three down to a thousand dollars when it matures. I've got a two hundred fifty three dollar capital loss, but that's offset because my bond is paying higher interest than the current market rate of interest. So those two together again make me earn exactly what the current market rate of interest is, no more, no less. The interest yield is simply going to be the interest payment divided by the current selling price. And that's a, that's a good question because if you look at the information here, you can calculate this pretty easily. You can also calculate this pretty easily. Okay, this is also called the YTM or the yield to maturity. And we'll learn how to calculate that with our calculator. What's difficult to calculate is this. But the thing is, if we can calculate the yield to maturity and we can calculate the interest rate yield, we know that the yield to maturity minus the interest yield it equals the capital gain or capital loss yield. Okay, and remember all of these uh, are in percentage form. All right, let's see. Where are we here? First of all, let me minimize this. Okay. Let me let me say one more thing. Actually, I forgot about this, but let me mention this, and then we'll be finished for the day. Um, but since I'm not going to be here next week. Starting last year, some of you might have attended this, and we've had some we've had some sessions during the year. But we've got a, a financial literacy group that we put together. It's, it's made up of departments from all over the, the campus, and the reason is we're trying to reach out to students, especially. I mean, business students are great, but you're the guys who actually people talk to you about loans, credit cards, investing, that type of thing. Imagine the thousands of students on campus that nobody ever talks to them about this. And they go out into the working world trying to finance a car, finance a house, get credit cards, invest for retirement, whatever. And so we decided this is a really important thing to reach out to these students. So we have a financial literacy group. We put on presentations about every other month. But in April, April is a really big month in terms of savings, National Savings Week. So. April 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st, I think that's a Monday through Thursday, we're going to have programs, I think they're going to be at 4 o'clock each afternoon, probably in Mason Hall Auditorium. Mason Hall is the nursing building, okay, it's, it's that direction. Now, we really would like a good turnout for this. So the reason I'm telling you this, for two reasons, one is if you've got, you've all got friends who aren't business majors. You're in fraternities, sororities, other organizations, and you know people that don't know squat about money. So we want those people there. We want that auditorium full of people. We're going to have different presentations every day. I'm going to be making a couple of presentations. Um, so that'll be, that'll actually be useful, I promise you. But also, because college students a lot of times need a little bit of encouragement, we're going to have some really, really good giveaways if you attend. Okay, last year we gave away an iPad. We gave away two $500 scholarships. We gave away, what else? A Yeti Tumblr, a Roku, and other things. I mean, really good and I know this because I bought these things, okay, out of the Center for Banking. I bought all these door prizes. I spent about $700 on door prizes um, for this. But again, we want to make it worth your while. And so the way it's going to work is the more sessions you attend, the more times you get your name in for the big drawings. So each day we're going to have drawings just for gift certificates, um, gift cards to different businesses, that type of thing. But then we're going to have the big drawings probably the last day and so the more that you've attended the more times you get your name in so if you've got friends if you need some kind of organization event 
why don't you just tell everybody, hey, let's just show up at this one day and let's just count as our weekly meeting, monthly meeting, whatever. Okay, so I'm telling you that so we get the word out. You'll see some emails, announcements, flyers. This is a big deal, but I want to get this out to you because, again, I'll be out all next week, and then it's going to pick up the Monday when I get back. So that's it. Everybody have a great day. I will see you on Thursday. Do you guys have flyers for the uh, uh, residence hall? I can I can give you some. I don't I don't have them yet. Yeah, if you want to, you can email me out and then uh, in our staff meetings I can get out to the RVs. That'd be fantastic.